the week before last when I spoke, um, I preached about builders, bullies, and Levites. And uh, I was praying again this week and uh, meditating and God gave me another word and I said, Lord, they're not going to believe this one either. And I was, I woke up, I was thinking about this. I was praying and thinking about this. When I went to sleep, I was thinking about this. And so this morning, my assignment I need to talk to you about entanglements. Entanglements. How many people know something about entanglements? Not you, but the person you know. Yeah, I told you, Lord, I told you. You're gonna talk about these entanglements, how you know you got one and how you get free from it. An entanglement. Ugh. Celebrities, we found out last year, had entanglements call entanglements not in cheat not I'm not cheating I'm just entangled all right you're gonna have to help me Holy Spirit Genesis chapter 11 verse 26 entanglements entanglements some people are entangled but you're gonna get free today <laughs> Genesis eleven twenty six, and would you just be so kind as if you would stand with me in honor of God's word? In honor of God's word. I see some people stand longer. There'll be some folks standing longer during the football game next week for their favorite team next Sunday. we stand to give honor to God's word because we realize that God speak we believe God speaks through us when we open this book after Terah had lived 70 years he became the father of Abraham Nahor and Haran this is the account of Terah's family line Terah became the father of Abraham Nahor and Haran and Haran became the father of Lot. When his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in the Ur of the Chaldeans, Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor, Nahor's wife was Milcah. And she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. Everyone say childless. Now I just want to up for one second because I actually wanted to start a little earlier. Go back to uh, 11, uh, just one verse, chapter 11, one verse that I want to read and then we'll come back to this. And that is... Uh, let's go to verse 10. This is the account of Shem's family line. Two years after the flood, when, oh, all, right, all right, when Shem was 100, I need my scripture. When Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arphaxid. Uh, watch, watch that carefully. Two years after the flood, Shem was the father of Arphaxid. And after he became the father of Arphaxid, Shem lived 500 years and had sons and daughters. And now can we go to verse 26? After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. While our father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abraham the, and his grandson Lot, uh, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, 
and the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Abraham's father initiated the move to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. Verse chapter 12, let's flip over. I understand there are no chapter and verses in the original language, but let's go to chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. One commandment, and look at this, five to one. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and your people and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. If you do this one thing, I'm going I'm to do five things if you do this one thing. And Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. And notice this, Abraham was 75 years old. If you notice, I'm trying to get you to pay attention to some numbers. Okay. Uh, when he set out for her. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem, and at that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram. He spoke to him earlier. He appeared to him and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. You don't even have children yet, but I'm already giving you a, a word about your children. I'll speak to generations through you. So he built an altar there to the Lord. He built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went out on the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Father, please see on our eyes that we may behold one of things out of thy law. Speak so clear that we know it is you. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, speak to us today about entanglements. We ask this in the name that is above every name. The precious name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Ugh, entanglements, entanglements. I love the scripture. I love uh, the book of Genesis, how Genesis starts. Starts out with a few things that uh, help us to understand who our God is. Number one, Genesis says, uh, in, uh, verse one, in the beginning, God. The Bible doesn't pretend to... Uh, hide the fact at all that God exists. The Bible doesn't even debate God's existence. The writer of, he, of Genesis just declares God's existence. That God is, first thing we know about him is that he is, not he was, he is. In the beginning, God created, he is a creator. God is still creating today. He's still making ways out of no way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form of void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Something happened between Genesis 1 and 1 and 1 and 2. God created. God didn't create a mess. It became a mess. Something happened right in between there. Earth was, earth was without form of void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Third thing we know, and the Spirit of God moves. God moves upon the face of the deep. The darkness. God is not transcendent. God is not out there. God is close. God is intimate. God is involved in his creation. God moves upon the face of the deep and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, we are we're, we're, we're a people of his word. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. We are people who are committed to the word, embodying the word, studying the word, living out the word. And you have to slow down to read the word because there's a lot you will miss 
if you don't slow down and, and, and read the word carefully. I want you to understand that God is a communicator. Everyone say God is a communicator. Now watch carefully. Before there was a human created, God spoke. God did not become a speaking being when he created humans. God spoke the world into existence. And then he created a human being who had the capacity to understand and interpret what he was saying. God spoke before he created Adam. That's how he created the world. God spoke. And when he created Adam and Eve, he created them with the ability to speak a language they've never learned. They never learned how to speak their language. Supernaturally, they had the ability to speak a language they've never learned. It sounds like what happens when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're supernaturally empowered to speak a language you've never learned before. How many know he's still creating? He's still creating. God is a communicator. He is intelligent. He is intelligence personified. He thinks, he feels, he speaks. Jesus is called the word of God. Jesus is God's final word. He's God's final word to us. And when he sends the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has one message that he speaks. That message is Jesus. I want you to understand that God desires to communicate with us today. I am convinced, I have learned in my years of walking with God, that God will not keep you guessing. If you're, if you're sincerely seeking him, God will, God will speak to you. God desires to communicate. And God's major mode of communication, the medium by which he communicates to us today, is his written word. The scripture. The Bible. A collection of 66 books. What was first communicated orally has now been written down and preserved. The power of God is, 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 is understood and in, in experienced when God speaks. But longevity is in the written word. Power is in the spoken word. Let there be light. Longevity to remember what he said is in the written word. So many people hear God speak. But when you ask him three weeks later what he said. The message starts to get confused. Well, I thought he said this. And this is why one of the most important things you can do is write down what God says to you. That ensures longevity. And so he has had us to, to uh, human beings to write down his word, holy men, that he spoke to. This is a collection of books that tell one unified story from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. It was written to a very specific audience in the ancient world. And that's what I was saying earlier. There's timeless information about the eternal God that was communicated to a certain people at a certain time, at a certain place, in a world very different from ours. It was written to them, but it was written for our benefit today. The longevity for our benefit today. And if you're going to understand God's word, you have to watch the gaps. Everybody say, mind the gaps. There are four gaps that you have to mind. You know, when you're getting off a train, if you're standing, waiting to get on a train, there's a little gap between the train where you're standing when you want to, they tell you to mind the gap. Don't fall in the gap. Watch your feet. Don't get stuck. There are four gaps that we have to mind. One is a linguistic gap. This book was written originally to people who spoke a different language. They spoke Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. That's different from us. So finding out what these words mean in their original language is important. We're going to show you how to do that. Very simple. Introductory level. Say linguistic gaps. 
Second gap is cultural gap. Everyone say cultural gap. It was written to people who lived in a different culture. I was talking with the pastor uh, yesterday, and I was talking about uh, the need for churches to have intercultural communication training, particularly when you're in a, in a, in a, a church that is multicultural. And as a uh, formally trained communication scholar, that is one of the most important skills that any person leading an organization and folks uh, who are part of a multi-organization can have. The ability to speak across cultures, the ability to understand the cultural differences. For example, they had different customs and times when you entered into a house in the ancient world and you were going to entertain someone, you would, you would remove your shoes. And then the servant would wash the feet of the travelers. And then you would anoint their head with oil. This was a culture of hospitality. In Luke 7 and 46, Simon the Pharisee was accused of failing to show Jesus hospitality because he didn't anoint Jesus' head. But Mary anointed his feet. The scripture takes on new meaning when you understand this was a violation of hospitality. Third one, everyone say geographical. It's a geographical gap. Many of the places mentioned in the Bible don't exist today. The geography has changed. And then the fourth one is the historical gap. To understand the different political, religious, economic climates that exist. They're different than they were today. So our job is to go back in and try to reconstruct as best we can the original setting in which the scriptures were heard. Got to mind the gaps. So I said to you last week that the Bible is a foreign land. When you're stepping into it, you got to remember those four gaps. And we need Jesus to do for us what he did for his disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 and 25. It said Jesus opened up their understanding, opened up their minds so that they can understand the scriptures. In other words, he fully explained and interpreted the scriptures in a way that they could understand what God had originally intended. It's one consistent story. One consistent story. Over 40 different authors written over a 2,000 year span. One consistent story, but really one author, the Holy Spirit. The story remains the same. The primary way that God intended to communicate to us today is through his word. And it is the inspired word of God. Say inspired. What that means is that it's God breathed. The words in your Bible, the stories in your Bible, they are God breathed. God moved upon the writers to write certain stories. What does inspired mean? Let me give you a very clear definition. And this is really, really important for you to know. This book contains everything you need to know, not everything you want to know. Inspiration means this is exactly what God wants you to know. Are there other things that you could know? Yes. But in there is everything he wanted you to know. The writers were very selective. The Holy Spirit said include that aspect of their life. That, that, that. No, nope, leave that out. Put that in, that in, that in, that in. You cannot tell the story of a 75-year-old man in 10 chapters. Ten chapters won't even, you can't even write the story of a two-year-old in ten chapters. God said, this is what I want them to know. Is there more about Abraham's life? Yes. But all we know is what God wanted us to know. That's inspired. It's the inspired word of God. From there, the Bible is sufficient, not exhaustive. The Bible is sufficient, not exhaustive. It tells you what is sufficient for you to know, not everything you want to know. I'm just laying some groundwork here. Trust me, I'm going to get to entanglement in a second. 
66 books. And this Bible is filled with different kind of literature, different genres, poetry, prophetic books, historical books. And each type of literature comes with a different expectation for how you should read it, what you should look for to understand what was the author trying to say. You got to understand what was the genre? How am I supposed to read it? Because different kinds of literature communicate in different kind of ways. So I challenged our group on, on, on Thursday night. I challenged them to, I forgot what deadline I gave them, but to, to memorize the 66 books of the Bible. And then the next step is to know the genres, to be able to group them in genres. Because that will shape the expectations you have when you read it. How are you supposed to read it? If you don't know the genres, you'll miss out on a lot. I'm going to try to demonstrate this in a little, a little bit. They're prof prophetic books. They're epistles. We'll talk about this in the weeks to come. But this morning, we're drawing a passage from a narrative. Everyone say narratives. The Bible is 43% made up of narratives. Everybody likes a good story. Everybody like a good story. I saw a movie yesterday, American Fiction, probably one of the best movies that I have seen in the past five years. It was, it was really good. I thought I was going to fall asleep. Not because the movie was bad, that's just me when I go to the movies. I don't know why I pay them to come there to sleep. But it was such a good story, and everybody likes a good story. You know, essentially human beings are just storytellers. Life is about stories, life, birth, death, graduation, marriage, uh, divorce, kids, sickness. Life is about stories. And God decided to communicate to us his word through stories. But the scriptures, brothers and sisters, is God's story. It is God's story. God enacting his plan of redemption. This is the story of redemption. You might hear this word, and it's, it, it, it shouldn't trip you up, the economy of God. People say in the economy of God, all they're saying is that in the plan of redemption. In the plan of redemption, God's story of redemption, he is communicating to us that he was not content to live without us. Before the world began, Jesus was already slain in the mind of God because he was not content to live without us. He's a God who is relational. So when you read narratives in the Bible, understand you are reading historical narratives about historical characters. These were people who actually lived. And in every story that you read, in every narrative, what I want you to understand is God is the hero. That's how they intended for you to read it. Most of the characters, the Bible characters that you will read about, not most of them, the 98% of them, they, they were flawed, flawed people. They are not the character. They, God, they're not the hero. God is the hero. Most of the time, you, don't, you shouldn't even want to be like them. They're so flawed. When I read Bible characters, I always, and I look at their flaws, I always say, God, where is that in me? Where is that in me? Cain, who killed his brother, Abel. I, sometimes I think I'm Abel, but no, 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 I'm more like Cain. Oh, yeah, sometimes I feel like I want to be like Peter, but no, sometimes I'm more like Judas. And so many of us in here, we're more like Judas. We may not sell him out for 30 uh, pieces of silver, but there's another price that we have. We have walked away. We have. I know you're sitting here. You look all saved now, but there's a little Judas inside of all of us. Jesus said to his disciples, one of you around this table is going to be betray me. I love the humility of the disciples because all of them said, Lord, is it me? All, the people that's so saved, they're like, it ain't me. It's them. All of them around, they all said, Lord, is it me? Because they realize I have the capacity to do the same thing. Sometimes they're not models for us to imitate. They're mirrors for us to check ourselves. So let me give you a quick study tip, and then I'm going to talk about entanglements. Is that all right? Narratives. 
there are three levels of narratives in the Bible. I think I'm all right. Three levels of narrative. You want to, when you read the narrative, you want to read it on three levels. Three levels. Three levels. Here is the top level. This is the top most important level. The top level is when you read from Genesis to Revelation. This is the whole universal plan of God through the story of redemption. This is the story of God who is not content to live without us. This is the story of creation and the fall and the promise of the Messiah, the chosen family, the chosen people. And ultimately it comes down, all of it is working towards Jesus taking on human form and coming to save us. That's the top story. The most important story is God's commitment to redeem us. When Ezra, I was preaching about Ezra and why did God send them back to rebuild the temple? Because God made a promise to Abraham that from your descendants, all people of the earth would be blessed. God made a promise to David that from your line, there would come a king. God made a promise that he was going to send a redeemer. And if you destroy Judah, you have no Jesus. It wasn't that, that they were so special. God was working, telling his story. I'm committed to redemption, the third level. And I got to save them because through them, Jesus will come. As you're reading, always think, how does this fit into the overarching story of redemption? Story of redemption. From Genesis to Revelation, you find Jesus in every book. When you read those books, sometimes those Old Testament books, you're like, what in the world is going on here? You see God, he, he's, his commitment to keeping his promise. I'm going to send a redeemer. I'm not going to leave you alienated from me. I'm going to come to get you. The second level, the middle level, is a level where you will read stories of God redeeming a people for his name. Top level, his universal plan. The second level, he is redeeming a people for his name. All of these people are constituted by a covenant. How do you know which, who these people are? He gave them a covenant. In the Old Testament, Moses and the Hebrew people became a nation by the giving of the law. The law constituted a covenant. Remember, God told Pharaoh to let my people go. Let my people go. Uh, uh, Second Chronicles 714 says, if my people called by my name, he was talking about a nation. This is God building together a nation. He gave them a covenant. He wanted them to be a people of his name. A people of his word, because you keep my word, you're going to be distinctive of all the people on the world. You are going to be different because you keep my word. And then Moses said, Lord, we don't want to go. We don't want to go if your presence doesn't go with us. That's what's going to make us different from all the other people on the world is that we have the presence of God. So God was choosing a nation who would be a people of his word, a people of his name and a people of his presence. He established a covenant with them. He gave them a promised land. When they were disobedient, they went into exile, but he brought them back. They faced some bullies, but he sent Levites and he restored them. The New Testament story is, is, is also a, a people that God's bringing together. Third level, his universal plan. Second level, he's bringing together people, a people who will be people of his name, a people of his presence, a people of his word. The New Testament, we have a new covenant. We took it last week when Jesus held up the blood. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Think about that in the upper room. For the first time, you have all three forms of the body of Christ. The physical body, incarnate in flesh. The symbolic body, the bread and wine. And the disciples, the mystical body sitting right there. The, the beginning of the universal church. All right there. He says, this is the church of Jesus Christ. This is my body. This is the people. That I'm calling to myself. Just stay with me. Then you have the first level. Where you read individual stories of people. That God moves in their lives. Individual stories. That make up the second level. He finds a young man named Joseph. The story of Joseph. The story of Moses. How God arrested them 
And from these individual people, when you read, think to yourself, how did they become a part of the people of God that he was calling? And how do these people fit into his overarching story of redemption? You know how the church hears about Jesus today? Uh, the world hears about Jesus? Through the church. The church, we're the only people authorized to preach his message. You got to understand when you read these individual stories, what God was doing in their life was connected to what he was doing in a people. And what he was doing in the people is connected to what he was doing in his universal plan of redemption. Think about your life. How did you meet Jesus? Every last one of us has an individual story of how we even got connected to this church. That's the first level. When you got connected to the church, that's the second level. The universal and the body and the purpose of the church is to communicate the story of the third level, the redemption of God. That's how you read it. The only problem is most people are stuck on the first level. They can't see past getting, the, getting stuff for themselves. What is God doing for me? No, 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 no. How is God writing your story to connect to his church? How is God moving in your life to connect you to the people that he's called? This is why Joseph said this to his brothers. Y'all meant this for evil, but God meant this to, for good to save you and your family. Because from that family, he was going to choose a nation. From that nation, he was going to choose a tribe. From that tribe of Judah, who were going to be the kings, he was going to produce a king who was going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He takes an individual, connects him to a body to fulfill his third level of his purpose of redemption. Are y'all with me today? So you got to ask yourself, whenever you're reading an individual narrative, when you're thinking about your story, how does this fit into what God is doing in the church, the body of Jesus Christ. That's why we don't come to church just to be served, we come to serve. Because we are a part of the body. Most people could ever, ever, ever get it in their heads and really get to walk it out that your story is connected to what God is doing on a larger level. Stay in Ithaca, Chris. No, I don't want to. Stay in Ithaca because you are going to play a role in the second level, the church, a local body that I need to gather. It's not all about you. It's not all about you. But Lord, I don't like it. And, and he had to work through all of that because he wanted to do something at the second level. And here we are, a body of people that's connected to his overall purpose. Think of all the people that's been saved that came to know Jesus through this church. And this is why he had to take Joseph through some stuff, because Joseph, his dream, all about me, 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 me. My dream, you're going to bow before me. By the time Joseph got to the end of his life, he said, y'all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. To preserve a whole nation in Egypt. Anybody understand how these narratives work when you read them? God is committed to his people. So in my last few minutes, let me talk about the call of God to start the story of redemption. He chooses a man named Abram. And I want to connect Abram's story to the people of Israel, first level to the second level. The Bible says that Abraham's father, Terah, had this desire to go to Canaan, which is ultimately where Abraham would go. Ape Terah was 70 years old when he had Abram and his brothers. He was 70 years old. Joshua said that Terah was one of the fathers who lived of old beyond the phrase in Joshua 7 and, uh, and 24. It said that Terah, the father of Abraham, he served other gods. He served other gods. He served other gods. Now, this doesn't mean a lot if you read it out of context. But it raised a lot of questions for me, Stephen. And I had to go back and say, now, why would that be important? Because when you read Ch uh, Genesis chapter 8, 9, and 10, you read about the flood. You read about God's commitment to people. 
He tells Noah, preach for 120 years that it's going to rain. And God said, everybody who want to be saved, you got to get in the ark. You got to get in the ark. I'm starting over. I'm going to start over with the family. Wipe out, wipe out the slate clean. I'm going to start over. I'm going to choose a family. Through that family, I'm going I'm to work out my story of redemption. And God said to them, get in the ark. Now, I want you to think for 40, 40 days and 40 nights, it rained. And it rained to the point that every living thing on the earth that wasn't in the ark died. This was a deluge. Can you imagine what it would feel like when you've never seen rain? You have never heard raindrops and everything, everything was destroyed that wasn't in the ark. This was a life changing event. And Noah a family of eight were the only ones who made it out. A family of eight. They come out of the ark, nothing was still alive. Can you imagine what that was like? All of your friends are gone. Everything that you once knew is gone. Your entire life is changed by this one cataclysmic event. Eight. Nine, God sends them out. He says, go out from the word. Fill the earth, Noah. Fill the earth. You and your sons and their wives, fill the earth. Chapter 11, it says the people did not want to fill the earth, but they gathered together to build the Tower of Babel. And they wanted to build the ta uh, tower, notice this, to reach heaven. But notice what the Bible says, how great your God is. That when God saw what they were doing, he said, let us go down. They're trying to reach heaven, and they thought, oh, we're going to reach heaven. And God said, mm, that's still not high enough. I got to come down where you are. Because he's high and holy. He's exalted. There's no telescope that can find him. I got to go down. No, you, go ahead. Use your best human efforts. You still cannot come to me on my level. He had to go down. And God confused their language. Here, and, and, and. Noah's grandfather, Noah's father, is a descendant of Shem, who was one of Noah's sons. Now, brothers and sisters, I had you to read a passage in Genesis. I started and had us to go back because there was a point I wanted to get. When you read Shem's genealogy, it starts with Shem and his son. And it says, and he lived 500 years. He was 100 years when he had his first son. And then he lived 500 years after that. That's 600 years. When you read down that genealogy, if you just do the math, Terah had Abraham when he was 70. Abraham leaves Haran when he's 75. If there are no gaps in this genealogy, this says, brothers and sisters, that Shem was still alive and outlived Noah. One of the people who was on the ark outlived Noah, outlived uh, Abraham, excuse me. If you go back and do the math, so you got to slow down. Why are they giving us those numbers? They're trying to tell you something. That means Shem outlived Abraham. And Abraham's father was worshiping false gods. Oh, I'm in the book. I love y'all. I love y'all. Y'all thinking like, ooh, we got to go look at that. Go ahead. Please, go ahead. Fact check me. Go ahead. How in the world do you experience something like that Everything you've known is wiped out. And seven generations later, you are so far removed from the God of mercy who saved your family. You have lost the story of God that now you are worshiping false gods. How in the world can you turn your back on God? Seven generations and one of the sons, if there are no gaps in the genealogy, is still alive today. How is it that the story of God, it wasn't passed from generation to generation? Somewhere it got lost. How does this happen? It happens when we lose generational memory, generational memory of the goodness of God. Here you find Abraham's father, Terah, initiated the journey to Canaan. Go ahead. I know y'all looking up the mathematicians. Go ahead. Go ahead. Initiates the journey into Canaan. Because God will use whoever he pleases to fulfill his purpose. 
The Bible says in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, that Terah initiated the journey into Canaan, but he failed to go beyond Haran. I had to ask, why did he fail to go beyond Haran? If Canaan was the journey, the destination, why did he fail to go beyond Haran? A city of northern Mesopotamia. The goal was to go to Canaan. What stopped them? It was the seat of idolatry. It was a place where there was great allure. Abraham's father was going to Canaan, but he stopped in Haran. I had to say, what was it that was about Haran? It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was this great city. It had to be. He settled there and said, no, 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 no. I don't want to go to Haran. But let me show you how good this city must have been because God had to command Abraham to leave it. There are some cities that I go to. You don't have to command me to, 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 to leave. Trust me. Because I mean, when God say you can go, I'm out on the first thing smoking. But then there are some cities when you really like it, God has to command you to go. What was it about this city? It was a city that was the seat of idolatry. Abraham was a socialite in this city. This was during the middle, middle uh, bronze, bronze period, the bronze age, where if, if, if a, a man was married to his wife, you were, you were of higher status in the community. Abraham was married to Sarai, who was his wife. You see why he wouldn't want to leave Haran? Because I get all of the privileges that come along with this. Now, this is just the way it was back then. God tells Abraham, I need you to leave. And the Bible says they're in Haran, all of these false gods. They've walked away from the God that saved them through the flood. And then the Bible says we read that Terah died when he was 205 years old. Abraham leaves Haran when he's 75 years old. That means for 60 years, you got to do the math, Abraham is living between Canaan and Haran. Canaan and Haran. He's going back and forth because his father and his father's people are in this seat of idolatry. And they got all the, the comforts of it. Abraham finds himself in the first entanglement that we're going to talk about. An entanglement is a situation in which you find yourself is complex. You can't get out of it. There's complexity there. For 60 years, he goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. His 60 years, he is under the influence of this culture. Then the Bible says something that's really important. The narrative, the author says, and when Terah died at age 205, now God says to Abraham, leave your father and your mother. Leave your people and leave your kindred. Why would God wait until his father died. For 60 years, he could have spoken to him. Why would God wait until his father dies? Isaiah said something like this, in the year that King Uzziah died, then I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Could it be that there are some things we can't hear until some other things die? Now God spoke to him. I know you've been going back and forth, Abraham, but now you got to sever the tie. You got to sever the tie. You got to sever the tie. I know you've been under the influence of your father, but now you have to sever the tie. Go to, go to Genesis 12 and 1. Put it up for me real quickly because I want to see this. I'm, to see this, I'm going to tell you these three entanglements and then, and then I'm finished. I want you to see this. The Lord had said to Abraham when his father died, go from your country. Notice this. Or country, two, your people, three, your father's house. Notice that the, this list increases in importance and intimacy. Country, your people, which is more important than your country, and then your household, which is more important than your people. It increases in importance and intimacy, and then go to a land that I will show you. 
He says, I want you to go. That's the word for somebody today, go. To go. I want you to go from your, from your country to your people and your father's household. Do you know what apostasy is? Is when you go after false gods. Sometimes the hindrance is we don't know what to go after. Apostasy is going after the, 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 the false gods. Pursuing your own evil desires is apostasy. When you're going after the wrong things, when you walk in darkness, you're going after the wrong things. And God tells Abraham, I need you to go from your country, your kindred and the house. Three things, country, to go from your country. In a real specific sense, it absolutely means to go from the land. Go from the land. Leave the geographical boundaries of this land. Haran was the capital of idolatry. And I need you to go. Abraham had to be commanded to go. His father settled there. I need you to leave your country. Why the country? Because the gods they tended to worship in Haran were national and city gods. I need you to cut ties with those things so I can truly satisfy you. This is the seed of idolatry. I need you to leave the country. I need you to leave their influence. What is interesting, brothers and sisters, I told you this. Abraham could physically leave. It wasn't just about a physical in, uh, entanglement. It was about a mental entanglement. It was about an emotional entanglement. I need you to leave the traditions of the country. I need you to leave the traditions, the expectations of the environment that you came out of. I need you to go. Secondly, he said, I need you to leave your kindred. Your relatives is what he said. And oftentimes this was a, it was a, a, a metonymy. It's a figure of speech where a part represents the whole. He didn't just mean a particular individual. He meant the collective of individuals. Your relatives. Abraham's family had moved with his father to Haran. Abraham started to obey God. Because I don't know if you remember when we read the Bible said Abraham, his wife Sarah, and his nephew Lot left with him. He pulled away from everything but his nephew. It's often the one thing that we cling to when God says, let it go. It's often that one thing. And I don't know whether he, 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 he didn't leave his nephew behind out of, out of you know, just, just, just love and commitment out of a sense of loyalty. I understand it. These were real commitments, real attachments. One of the greatest lessons I had to learn is that I'm not called to help everybody. I'm not called to help everybody. Every person hasn't been assigned to me from God. When, when John the Baptist, when, when, when John the Baptist, Jesus comes on the scene and people start telling John the Baptist about, about Jesus and all the people that's gathered around him. And they went back to tell John so that John can be jealous. John said this response. I can only receive that which has been given to me from heaven. In other words, I can only receive what has been given to me from heaven. If they weren't assigned to me, I can't receive them. Everybody hasn't been assigned to you. And Abraham's biggest problem is that he could not let go of his nephew Lot. When you read the story of Abraham after this, for the next few chapters, Abraham gets into conflict. There is war because of his nephew Lot. God said you have to leave him. He lost opportunities. Sometimes you have to leave them not because they're not good, but because God says so. One of the hardest things for me to do this week was to sit down on Monday morning after my grandmother was here, my parents was here, my, aunt, my nieces were here, folks that I, that, I, that, I, that I know from my home, and I had to wake up Monday morning and realize that they're gone. And I was reading about Abraham, and I thought about the very real attachments he must have had. 
One of the hardest things to do is when God actually calls you into a different place for the purpose that he has for you. He said, Abraham, I want you to leave your kindreds, the clan people of the ancestral gods. He said, I want you thirdly to leave your father's house. Understand it could be a physical house, which meant a dwelling or a habitation. Interestingly enough, the, the names of some places in Canaanite land were stemmed from the temples of local deities, like Beth Shemesh, which meant the temple of the sun god. He says, I want you to leave your father's house. This is the most intimate. He wasn't just talking about a physical house because I'll, I'll tell you why. The 10th commandment is, is that thou shall not covet thy neighbor's house, their belongings. It, it's not about the physical building, it's what's inside of it. He is saying, I need you to walk away from what's inside of that house. I need you to walk away from the entanglement that is represented in the way you think. Because the most important house, Abraham, that you are going to join is not your father's house, but the house of the Lord. An entanglement, a situation or relationship A situation or a relationship that you are involved in that is difficult to escape. As I begin to pray and think about this, many of us have entanglements that are mental. We're under the influence of things and people the way society has taught us, the, even the way church tradition has taught us. Financial entanglements, relational entanglements. My prayer for you is that God allows you to disentangle yourself from your past in all the right places. And I know in, 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 in pop culture, uh, we talk about entanglements, you talk about society and celebrities, but Abraham was 75 years old and had some things he had to disentangle himself from. Expectations. Your expectations from your life. Here is what I want to do. You got to, here is where I'm going to be. Here is how God's going to use me. From family pressure, from your dreams, from social pressure. From the image and the false images that we've created of ourselves. The entanglement of success or marriage, or this is what family is gonna look like for me at this age, at this stage. Entanglements can become idols. Controlling influences in your life. Leave the country, leave, leave, leave the kindred, leave the household. These are influences, Abraham. Sometimes ministry aspirations can become an entanglement because it becomes more about you than it is about him. And he says, okay, I need you to give that up. Give up what you had in mind. Give up what you had in mind. I remember I, I, sometimes I would sit in churches. Lord Jesus. And I would hear speakers and they were horrible. That's just the truth. There was no word, there was no substance. And I'd sit on the front row with my prideful self See, you understand that pride is like a snake. It can get in the littlest of cracks. And I was saying, man, I could do much better than that. And God said, I'm going to let you sit right there until you entangle, disentangle yourself from this idea of who you're going to be. How, I'm going to let you sit right there until all of that is burned out. And God will let you sit in a situation until you disentangle yourself. Here's what I want you to see when you read the rest of this. 
The more Abraham disentangled himself from those things, the more he became entangled with God. The more Abraham disentangled himself from those things, the more he became entangled with God. What's the point of all of this? It's really reading this narrative. When you look at from the date God spoke to Abraham, until Abraham finally got rid of the last entanglement is Lot. I jotted it down here. By conservative estimates, okay, it was between 20 to 60 years that Abraham, a grown man, remained in an entanglement between 20 to 60 years. A lot of issues Abraham faced in his life because he wouldn't disentangle himself. Here's what I love. I told you in every story, God's a hero. What you see in this story is God's unwavering commitment to flawed people. God's steadfast commitment and his grace to give people time to work through their entanglements. I don't know, and this is why, this is why one of the things is that I've learned, I've learned to listen to God and, and, and extend grace. He'll say, no, 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 I'm working there. It's between 20 to 40 years, 60 years for Abraham to disentangle himself. And the more Abraham disentangled himself, the more he entangled himself with God. I don't know what entanglement you find yourself in. Some people it might be relational. Some people it might be intellectual. Some people it may have to do with spiritual entanglement that's not rooted in what God has spoken over your life. And sometimes it's rooted in ambition. And Abraham wasn't 20, Abraham was 70. So this is not just something for young people. But I want to say to you, I don't know how you got in an entanglement, but I do know how you can get out. The story, third level. Because the same way the story of creation began is the same way the story of the history of redemption began. And God said to Abraham, go and God said let there be light the same way creation began with the word is the same way Abraham's disentanglement began with the word how are you going to become disentangled it's going to start with a word here is the word God told me to give you go like he told Abram, go forth from your country, your family, your kindred, go. The word is go. There's so much power in that one word, it'll carry you for the rest of your life. Go into all the world to make disciples. Go and sin no more. Go back to school. Go and try again. Go and love again. Go and do it again. Go. That's his word to you. To go. Go apply again. Go look again. Go try again. Go. The more you become disentangled, the more you became entangled with God. Because first God spoke to him. But as he kept going, the next time you hear about Abraham and God, and God appeared to him. You keep reading, he's disentangling, and then God came down and cut covenant with him. The more you go, the more you're going to become entangled with God. Go in love again. Go and try again. You know what my job is? Jesus said to Mary and Martha when their brother had died, remove the stone. What did he say to Lazarus? Come forth. Essentially, he was saying, go. 
But then he said something to his disciples. Mary and Martha, y'all move away to stone. Jesus, who spoke a word to create the world. Same God who spoke to Abraham and said, go. Is the same one who spoke to Lazarus and said, come forth. And then he says this to the disciples. Loose him and do what? Anybody know? Loose him and let him go. He was bound in grave clothes. You know what Jesus was saying? Disentangle him. Disentangle him. Disentangle him. He's in an entanglement. Disentangle. The word is spoken. Come out. Disentangle him. Disentangle him. Disentangle him. Every time you come to church and you hear a word from God, that's another layer that should come off of you. I'm thinking differently. Poof. Something else is changing on the inside of me. Stand with me. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm going to tell you something. I'm the pastor of this church. There are still some areas of my life that I'm still being disentangled from. It could be sometimes just could be the way I think about certain things. What I love is that God was so gracious with Abraham that you see God is committed to flawed people. When I read that, that passage gave me so much joy because guess what? I stand amongst all of the people who are flawed. My goal for you today was to leave out of here knowing I am going forward. I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I'm here to declare to you my past is over. My past is over. In you all things are made new. I surrender my life. I am moving forward. The word for you today is go. It's to go. That's it. Go. Like he told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. He told the disciples, go in all the world. There's so much power in that one word. greatest, the strongest entanglements that we find ourselves in. Many ways are in how we've been socialized to think, how we've been conditioned by metaphorically and sometimes literally the country, the kindred, the influences of the things around us. And when Terah died, then God said, all right, sever the core, sever it. I'm taking you to Canaan. And the Bible says there he began to call on the name of the Lord. He made a declaration in a place where there was idolatry. He said, no, it's over. He said, it's over. I just want to pray really quickly. Just give me two minutes. If you're here, and whatever it might be, you hear God saying to you loud and clear, go, try again, go do again. Whatever your goal is connected to, and you said, you know what? I have some entanglements, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Everybody's got them. Everybody got them on some level. Some people have to become disentangled from the expectations you had for God that he did not meet. You can be disappointed in God, but realize, you will realize that God never disappoints. And that's why God will give people time to work through their stuff. He's not intimidated by that. He's committed to flawed people. For some others, this is a confirming word. You, you really got to go. He's been saying it over and over again. I need you to go. I need you to go. Today is the day I'm severing whatever it is. I gotta, I, I gotta, I gotta follow God. 
and and God knows their very real connections like Monday I, I was so low I was so low I was so emotionally low because I thought man my family was just here the day before I said Lord this is where you called me and as I begin to read this passage joy and peace begin to come if you're here and you heard God say go I want you to come to this altar. I want to pray with you. 